Good day, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm a CPA and a partner with Baker Tilly. Uh, when I'm not uh, doing ESG presentations, the majority of my work revolves around uh, utility rate studies and utility financings. But I've also been part of our uh, internal uh, focus at B uh, Baker Tilly regarding ESG and how ESG impacts uh, our practice. Uh, and then also helping um, in this regard with um, assisting clients and in, in developing solutions for clients uh, and communities as, as it relates to their ESG strategy and, and what they're going to do. So we're going to introduce uh, my co-presenters uh, co today and then we'll get into the uh, material. Susan, you want to go ahead? Sure. Hi, I'm Susan Reed. I'm a manage, managing director within Baker Tilly's Municipal Advisory Group and I help um, to lead our the firm's public sector ESG efforts. I have a background in working for state government. I am a lawyer and have served as bond counsel, and I've worked in economic development and community development um, for a public power joint action agency that served a number of municipalities as well. So ESG is something that uh, you know really resonates in so many different areas around um, around government, and um, it's it's an exciting time to be a part of it. Dave, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dave Erdman, I'm also a managing director for Baker Tilly. Uh, recently joined the firm after a long career as an issuer for the state of Wisconsin. Um, as an issuer, I was involved with uh, ESG efforts in the sense of working with issuer groups to develop best practices to address all parts of ESG as to how it impacts a municipal transaction. So um, help with uh, Scott and Susan on ESG efforts here at Baker Tilly and thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you both. We're going to spend just a, a couple slides real briefly about Baker Tilly, just for those that aren't aware. We are a, a leading uh, advisory CPA firm um, and looking to uh, really help clients uh, grow their value, uh, protect and enhance their value. And, and we do this on a on, on a coast to coast basis at this point with some of the growth that we've experienced over the past few years and and also uh, part of our, our global um, uh, group as well with with uh, presence all around the world. So in total, we've got over uh, 6,500 people now, which is uh, just amazing. Uh, 500 plus partners uh, in the firm. And we have a, a long history of working with uh, public sector entities, uh, 90 plus years uh, of being active in the in the public sector. Um, in terms of the number of bond issues, uh, according to Thomson uh, Reuters in the last um, rating, we were uh, number nine uh, in the country. So we do a lot of this work, uh, work with over 1300 different governmental clients uh, across 50 different offices uh, throughout the country. So very excited to be with you today. Glad that you could join us. We do have um, uh, some, some key objectives that we hope you're able to take away uh, from this session as we, we talk about ESG. And Susan's right, this really impacts, ESG impacts everything that uh, governments, local governments, state governments provide uh, to their constituents and, and their citizens. So we hope that, number one, we'll, we'll level set ESG for those that, that maybe aren't as up to speed on this and, and what this means and, and why it's important to government. And then we'll hear about what's driving some of the expectations in the market and, and why this is a topic now and how it's impacting bond ratings and, and how we go about uh, obtaining capital for projects. Uh, we'll learn about what um, what uh, entities can do as far as adopting uh, strategies and plans and, and how to move those forwards and then how to mitigate risk as well. Uh, so with that, Susan, I think we'll turn it over to you to uh, start the level set process and describe you know, exactly what is ESG. Well, great. Yes, that's very important. First, we need to understand what ESG is to have this discussion. ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance factors that affect an organization's risk and their opportunities, both financially and through its operations. ESG is very focal for both corporations and also for governmental units right now, including utilities. And in recent years, there's been a variety of factors that have raised the visibility and the importance of ESG factors. These things include economic and social um, operational disruptions that resulted from COVID, the COVID pandemic, 
certainly we saw things that we never thought could occur, did occur during that time. And it really did show uh, organizational's ability to function and continue operations through things that were unforeseeable, really, at that time. Climate-related issues, such as the increase of climate-related disaster occurrences and energy transition and considerations in the cost. And social and economic issues, such as the availability of housing, particularly in an economy experiencing inflation. And the need for diversity and inclusion, um, and in, in the ability to attract a talent. These are all things that um, are a piece of, of ESG and really are driving um, it it and its importance. So when you're looking to understand um, ESG and the complexities of defining what ESG is, it's important to consider where it started and how it's evolved. ESG began through international investor interests to have a more transparent and complete disclosure around these issues, particularly for publicly traded companies. However, it's really evolved and ESG, um, as ESG related assessments were made, it, they became useful tools to allow organizations to have a better set of metrics um, that can be used to guide operations and to drive sustainable outcomes. ESG provides a more holistic assessment for, and the ability for governments, corporations, and utilities to sustain operations and financial stability when assessed in conjunction with their financial statements. Additionally, it enables governments and businesses to assess operation models, operational models that mitigate ESG risk and to capitalize on opportunities as well. Next slide, Dave. So looking at the importance of ESG, ESG has also evolved from being just informational that is um, externally provided to the disclosure for those investors as we discussed it, where it started to being a useful tool really to assist in an organizational sustainability strategy. Um, but, you know, it's also important to attract, to assist with the attracting of talent, um, such as employees who want to work for the organizations that are good corporate citizens and also manage risk. And it can be a signal to investors, residents, corporate partners that you are committed to improving the quality of life in your community and protecting the environment as a part of this. So really, um, you know, ESG is, is very important to an organization strategy and, and a governmental entity strategy. And you may be thinking that as a public entity, again, what Scott was saying, this affects much of what we do. And um, you're absolutely correct in that assessment. These concepts really aren't new but um, rather the gathering of these concepts under the ESG umbrella, that's really what is a new piece. Um, the recognition that they interrelate as a component. And as they've been gathered together, there are increased um, requests for common understanding of what ESG is and the definitions to provide greater transparency to stakeholders and easier assessments of these important factors. So while there isn't, you know, one definition right now that's internationally accepted, there are different um, structures of how to define ESG and, and still, uh, you know, there are things that have become sort of themes that fall under the ESG bucket and will likely continue to evolve. In fact, they certainly will continue to evolve. So we wanted to take a deeper dive into each uh, what falls under each of these three categories, starting with environmental considerations. And Scott and Dave, we kind of tag team, they're going to jump in on these slides and this discussion. Um, this is an area where pe most people will have the most familiarity. Environmental issues include climate change related considerations, disaster prevention, preservation of natural resources, pollution and, and waste reduction and opportunities to transition into clean tech, zero emissions economy. Organizations, both municipal bond and corporate bond issuers are utilizing green, sustainable and social bonds uh, where eligible to, to finance projects that may have a green or sustainable purpose. Um, the New York Met Authority is one of the most prominent issuers of green bonds. And Dave, do you maybe want to share some um, perspectives on, on this issuer? Um, yes, the MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York, 
um, you know, the largest transit public transit provider in the Western Hemisphere, um, has been following greener sustainable bond principles actually since 2016. Um, and they issue a, a lot of bonds for a large transportation system. And in their financings, you know, they meet the uh, climate bond initiative for a low carbon transit provider. Um, and again, has a long history of doing that since 2016. Uh, this authority is responsible for, you know, subway transportation in New York, but also bridges and other um, uh, transit means in New York City. So a classic example of, you know, an issue are taking advantage of ESG to issue some green and sustainable bond financings. Yeah. And so, you know, green bonds um, are, are pretty intuitive. It's those things that fall under this environmental um, bucket and have enough of a tie to that financing in order to qualify with certain criteria to be designated. Um, if you're using a standard structure, there's a, what we're actually gonna cover um, different ways that bonds are designated on our next webinar, but um, sustainable bonds have an element of social and, and green. Um, when kind of looking at other projects that we're seeing, you know, financed, uh, really there is a, a big push um, for electric vehicles and fleets and, and with governmental units, um, you know, in the conversion of, uh, from traditional fleets to to these um, electric projects, not only involve the purchase of the the actual equipment itself, the the vehicles, but also to build the infrastructure to support that. And then uh, communities are complete that complete projects that promote water conservation and management. This would fall under the green umbrella. I know many communities are doing that. Um, Louisville Utilities recently issued green bonds to complete sewage and drainage projects that reduced water pollution and protected water assets, including the Ohio River Basin. And finally, um, corporations are focused on green initiatives, particularly those with a global presence. Um, one example that we have is Subaru Indiana, really for a number of years has been operating at a zero landfill manufacturing plant uh, in at one of its locations in, in the U.S. And we know that um, many of the OEM automotive, automotive manufacturers have placed a retirement date on internal combustion engines um, and plan to transition to inter, in electric vehicles. And Scott's going to kind of cover some of the drivers that will likely to continue to make this E um, in the ESG umbrella even more prominently in years to follow. Anything to add on that, Scott or Dave? I would just add one thing. Another interesting project that I'm working on right now, um, a utility project, is a, a situation where we've got a, a client that needs to do some work at their wastewater treatment plant. That plant produces um, methane gas. They use part of that right now, about half of it, to heat the facility, and the other half of it uh, essentially gets flared off into the atmosphere. So we're looking at a project since a lot of that work uh, on that component of the plant needs to be replaced anyway. Looking at a project that's going to not only replace that equipment, but add a gas cleaning skid that will then clean up that gas to pipeline standards. And they're gonna be able to um, either inject it into the pipeline and sell it to the natural gas provider across the street or potentially a third party supplier. So not only are we cleaning up the atmosphere somewhat, um, but also producing a new revenue stream as well. So it's those kinds of things, thinking about those kinds of things that are, are really attractive in this space right now. Yeah, I can think of another client um, with which we work in. They have deployed solar around uh, their you know, treatment plants in order to offset the energy costs uh, around the, the treatment plants. You know, Again, kind of an operational uh, play that also is good for the environment too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lot, lots of opportunities really in, in this this space. So the social examples um, also have meaningful impacts on operations as well. Um, these aspects include human capital, diversity, equity, inclusion, that, that DEI that you often hear, and things that affect the health of communities like affordable housing, access to infrastructure like uh, broadband when we think of working in our homes much more and, you know, students who had to work remotely, um, certainly that divide between those that have um, internet access was, was huge and, and important to the ability to have uh, the resource that, that you really need to just operate in the economy and learn. 
um, and generally underserved, understanding the needs of underserved, uh, like the ability to find transportation to work, health care, uh, child care. Externally, social ESG drivers include the, um, the recent water crisis in Jackson, Mississippi, that more directly affected minority populations and lead-based pipe issues in Detroit that, so, that socially disadvantaged uh, ratepayers were impacted as well there. Um, in California, there's a housing crisis that results from the rising cost of housing and the lack of affordable alternatives for residents. And this problem um, is also becoming really more of an issue throughout the country. I know almost everywhere right now there is a housing crunch and a lack of supply. So, uh, you know, that's that's certainly an important thing for communities to sustain people and, um, you know, to continue to, to be able to support all of all of their residents. Um, finally, the corporations and governments are focusing on initiatives to support employees through um, through things to encourage the DEI, um, stewardship opportunities, and really just to allow for better, better quality of life for its employees through programs like mental health support, uh, flexible work schedules, and paid maternity as well as paternity leave, just to name a few initiatives really that companies are doing to attract and retain talent. Um, even in this down economy, feasibly for the next year, my understanding from economists is that that still is going to be a driver uh, for governments, for organizations, still a, a, a crunch for, for talent. Okay. All right. Anything that, there you guys want to add? No. The only thing I would add is the theme you're going to hear throughout this webinar is just how ESG relates to just normal operations of government. And I think that's really evident here with the S for social. Uh, governments are responsible for housing, education, you know, all classic examples of what governments do on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely. So when you kind of look at the, the G piece, um, which is the remaining puzzle of the ESG puzzle, governance focus is probably the most different between, between publicly traded companies and governmental entities in that um, the corporate focus has a deeper dive into issues um, such as executive compensation when you're looking at companies, um, however, really governance is critical piece for both public entities as well as public companies and, and companies as a whole. And it focuses on leadership teams, financial management and transparency and risk management. All things, whether any organization uh, should and needs to have a handle on. So post COVID cybersecurity is probably the most prominently emerging and continuing issue. However, succession planning and adequate staffing in order to continue to support essential services um, are also very important and vulnerabilities for, for many governments and schools and utilities, you know, particularly a kind of as, as there is a little bit of a talent war and, and increasing wages and, and demands and opportunities. Um, this is, you know, again, I think been become even more apparent during um, the pandemic. Uh, I know when working with clients and rating agencies, there's always a question about where, where you're able to continue operations when you, know, you may have had people out uh, for illness, you know, or even just quarantining during COVID. So, you know, there is a heightened awareness of the need to maintain essential uh, service operations for sure. And Susan, for this one on governance, you know, year end, we're seeing reports as to, you know, the status of, uh, pension, um, retirement system, other post-employment benefit programs, and, you know, where they are with respect to unfunded liabilities. And often, you know, the risk associated with those unfunded liabilities, but also the opportunities to address those liabilities fall underneath the, the G part of the ESG umbrella. Absolutely. Yep. And, in, you know, and policies and things, too, also are important, you know, in a governance piece, internal controls, uh, investment policies, you know, which, you know, if you have the opportunity to uh, feasibly make up some gaps when you have, you know, rising interest rates, that, that can be the kinds of things that, that can, um, you know, be effective governing tools, too. Okay, so... Um, Let's see, going on to, I'm going to turn it on over to, um, it, to Scott. Yeah. yeah. It comes to me. Thank you. So we're, we're going to talk a, a little bit about the drivers behind 
this particular issue. And, and you're going to notice that we're going to try to, uh, well, we are, we're going to keep it out of the political realm because ESG does uh, appear in the daily news from a political perspective. And it's been interesting to see how all that plays out. But as you've heard from these past examples, these issues, these topics are things that governments deal with uh, on a daily basis because of the, the nature of their role, the, the role that they play. And so there are a, a wide variety of responsibilities that governmental units have. And because of that, there are a lot, a, a wide variety of stakeholders that influence those governments. And, and you can see those uh, listed here on the graphic. And, and what we're seeing, as you heard Susan mentioned, uh, this focus really came to be overseas and has been um, coming to uh, our shores here and, and becoming a much bigger um, emphasis point over the past few years. And so what we see now are investors that are looking at your uh, proposed financings and looking at financings in general and, and, and the market and where do they want their money, where do they want to put their money to work and we're seeing more and more investors that want to um, invest in entities that are taking environmental and social and governance issues into account as they operate their businesses. So that is certainly something uh, that we see more and more of as we go forward. At the same time, we're seeing regulators uh, start to dip their toes into this. And, and are there things, are there areas that uh, are are needing or wanting uh, regulation as we look at at uh, ESG. And so we'll, we'll talk here in a second about um, a proposal from the SEC, but, but these are getting the perspective or are getting the attention of regulators as well. And so we need to keep that in the back of our head. Our citizens, our, our community stakeholders are, are interested in this. If, if you're a growing community and, and looking to attract uh, young talent to your community. These are, are topics that uh, a lot of uh, folks in the younger generations are looking uh, looking at and, and wanting to see in their community. So how do we address those needs and, and develop a, a plan uh, for that as well? Employees, same, same sort of thing. We've got employees that um, are, are interested in uh, is their retirement uh, benefit funded? Are, are we doing what we need to in terms of uh, uh, operating efficiently and, and with a mindset of trying to take care of the environment. Uh, customers, uh, an, another um, uh, stakeholder group that are, are interested, are, are our customers um, uh, looking to see that we're taking a lead in this area and, and doing, uh, as a governmental uh, unit, are we doing what we can to uh, prioritize and, and address these issues? So there's a, a variety of of um, uh, points of view on this and, and all of them kind of focus back to the service that that we provide and and how how all that plays out and and it's going to be something that we continue to see uh we think going forward and i'm going to just jump in with one kind of question before it gets too far um back um the question I think maybe even was a slide ahead that just was asking, how does the wave of retirements and people leaving their jobs affect governance? Um, the loss of expertise for governance as time goes on post pandemic. Uh, and that that's that's significant. I think, you know, as um, as you look at kind of what again, when you look at what rating agencies are weighing, um, you know, they are weighing the ability of continued ability, ability to operate and um, that transfer of knowledge and succession planning, um, you know, is really critical to keeping um, that loss of, of knowledge from, from leaving um, without really helping to, to retain as, as much as, as you can his, uh, institutionally. There, there again, that's another, you know, another issue that falls into both the governance and the, the social component, providing opportunities for people to grow and develop in their careers, both at the end of their career, moving on and being able to transfer that knowledge, but then also the, the newer generations coming along and, and being given those opportunities at the same time, um, making sure that the entity itself is resilient and sustainable and going to be able to continue to 
to proceed. And Susan, you and I were at a meeting earlier this week where this is a major issue for for that particular entity. And, and how do they work through that? And how does that fit into their strategy to be sustainable? Um, and so it, it is, it's a, it's a variety of issues that roll up into, uh, into this ESG focus. I, I mentioned that the SEC um, last April, uh, SEC issued a proposed rule that would require, and there's a whole lot of words on these, this slide, I'm not going to go into the, the details, but it would generally require um, entities that are uh, traded on the, uh, on the market to start um, disclosing and providing a whole lot more information about their uh, greenhouse gas emissions and monitoring those metrics and what are they doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this it's been a process as this has played out. Um, there's been a lot of uh, information uh, questions uh, that have been provided and have been asked. There's been going back again briefly to the political realm. There's been a lot of uh, push and pull in, in the political sphere as well, uh, especially as we have now um, a split government with a, a Democratic administration and and a um, Republican House, Democratic Senate. So it's, it, it is very much in play and we'll see where this ultimately leads. Um, but it is something that I think while it is focused on just on private companies right now, I, I think it's uh, important and instructive for public center and sector entities, governments to be watching this and, and see where this goes because ultimately it could uh, potentially roll down to us and, and impact us. Um, if you flip the, the slide uh, there, Dave, uh, as far as takeaways go from this discussion, and there is a, a polling question that just popped up if you are interested in the CPE, you know, when you think about public companies and whether or not they're going to have to start tracking and monitoring their greenhouse gas emissions, as you start to think about scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, some of that goes back to their, you know, their sources of products, their sources of, of resources to do what they do, and then carries forward ultimately to their customers, which um, could ultimately be local governments. I mean, local governments are in their supply chains, both ahead of and behind um, uh, some of these entities that are, are traded on the markets. And so they're going to be looking to you to say, okay, how are you impacting our score? And, and that's all going to get uh, potentially brought into uh, your sphere as well. So you're going to need to be watching this and, and seeing how it plays out. There isn't any sort of standard process yet, whether it's the SEC or other regulatory entities or some of the um, bond designations that we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. There isn't a standard process right now. So um, you, you just need to keep your eyes and ears open and try to absorb as much information as possible and, and be prepared uh, and be thinking proactively about how to address these issues and what is your strategy going to be uh, to deal with this as we move forward. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, I'm going to talk about current expectations around ESG in the municipal marketplace. Um, you know, interest in ESG is growing. Um, as an issuer, I think I was presented with some ESG concepts back in 2012, and I mentioned how the MTA started issuing uh, some green bonds in 2016, which was about the time that the issuance of green bonds actually, or designated bonds, actually started to increase. Um, interest in ESG, though, is, is more than designated bonds. And I just want to spend some time, you know, before we dive into this chart, talking about how the interest in geo, ESG in the municipal market is actually probably three or four prongs. Um, one is that we have rating agencies that are more interested in ESG risk factors. Um, because of that, we have issuers that need to spend a little bit more time on disclosures in ESG, both to address those risks, but also to present opportunities to investors that may be interested in bond proceeds that are addressing a certain ESG area. And then finally is just the, you know, related to the investors part is just the designation, you know, whether that be green or sustainable or social or otherwise. And we'll go into more of those details later in this webinar and in our next webinar on this topic. Um, but with respect to the interest in ESG, this chart does show how it has grown. 
Uh, there is a little drop off at the end of this, but it also I think reflects that uh, um, you know municipal issuance you know had a, a slower year this year you know calendar year 2022 than previous years. Uh, the MSRB just released a report this morning that talked about how you know the amount of issuance that occurred, new money issuance that occurred this year. Uh, is down to the lowest level since 2018. So I, that decrease there and toward the end of this chart kind of reflects that. But the same MSRB report also highlights that trade volume increased and it was uh, 66% higher than 2021. Um, you know, I, I don't think ESG has the tools in place yet to identify with respect to those trades, how much of that actually relates to ESG and what ESG has impacts on the trade volume in municipal bonds. But while it was a slower year for new money issuance because of less, less refundings probably, um, the key point is that there still is significant interest in municipal bonds. And some of that interest probably is because of ESG. And that's all highlighted by the trading volume increasing by 66% over the previous year. Um, with respect to ESG, you know, a big driving point of this is the investors. Um, it's been mentioned how this started overseas. Um, there's different stock exchanges in, in, in England and so forth. They really put a focus on ESG and that's starting to come over to the U.S. market. Um, there's some data on this slide from a, a, news, a Bloomberg news story from November of 2022, uh, but definitely highlights, you know, why investors are interested in ESG. Um, I think the most important dot point here probably um, is the second and third dot points where, you know, ESG funds are just having better return uh, than non-ESG funds in the past past year. As for you know, issuers and so forth in the municipal market, um, the, the growth is actually demonstrated in numerous ways. And um, this kind of all relates to, again, risk, disclosure, and designation. Um, you know, first off, the growth in the municipal bond market is identified by the visibility in the bond, bond buyer. And for those that aren't aware, the bond buyer is the daily publication of public finance. Uh, they have a separate section on ESG and have numerous stories about the focus and the impact of ESG on the municipal marketplace. Uh, secondly is the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, MSRB. Uh, their EMA website has recently been expanded to include an EMA labs and other search functions that allow for investors to find more information about ESG designated bonds, you know, through a search function or otherwise. Uh, the MSRB also in uh, February, March of calendar year 2022, put our request for information, which uh, required all parties in the municipal marketplace, issuers, advisors, attorneys, investors, to provide some insights as to how ESG is impacting their market. Um, the MSRD put out a summary of those, of those uh, survey results um, for people to look at. Furthermore, IPRIO and Bloomberg, uh, new service and data tracking services have a focus on, on ESG. With respect to the bond market, um, a couple of years ago, when you mentioned ESG, the first kind of response was, well, what's in it for me? You know, how are my bonds going to price better if I go down this path of having a designation? I think over the last couple of years, people have realized that ESG is more than just, you know, trying to get a better price for your bonds. But that is one of the benefits of ESG. Um, you know, with designated bonds, there have been bond issues that have occurred in the last year where the issuer has been able to demonstrate an increased order flow. And with bond pricing, you know, more demand for your bonds remain, results in um, a higher price, which results in a lower cost of capital. Um, you know, some issuers have actually sold designated bonds and non-designated bonds on the same day. Um, and while a direct comparison of the resulting uh, final yields and prices for a designated bond and non-designated bond issue may on the surface appear to be the same, um, behind the scenes, that increased order flow is something that really has benefited not only the green bond designated series, but also the non-green bond designated ser series. Rating agencies have also been increasing their focus. And again, rating agencies are not there to talk about designated bonds, but rating agencies are focusing on risk factors and what risk factors have on an overall bond rating for a municipal issuer. Um, you know, the all four rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor, Fitch, and Kroll, have addressed ESG risk factors. Uh, some are more vocal and more visible as to how they uh, uh, report those results in their rating reports, but it's something that obviously is being taken into consideration. And as I mentioned, with respect to disclosure, uh, because the rating agencies are highlighting that risk, um, it's it's a more of a focus of issuers to, to disclose those risks. Um, with respect to risk disclosure, one could argue that if they were risk, those should be risks that have been disclosed all along. 
But the current discussion on ESG definitely is highlighting that um, you know more focus has to be placed on risk disclosures. On the flip side, th those disclosures that address um, risk can also be useful in promoting ESG efforts within your community, which investors may be looking for as they evaluate investment decisions going forward. And just to hop in, Dave, to a couple things. Um, so we have a question that came in that's right in the wheelhouse of this question, where we're at in the discussion, and it's, is there a weighting of risk to bond issuers in relative terms versus other risk factors? Um, in other words, does ESG have more influence as a percentage of the overall risk as time goes on? Um, again, I think, you know, there is a need to disclose material risk. So as these issues become sort of more prominent as risk that may not occur on financial statements, uh, or, or occur be uh, be as visible. Looking at you know the the past financial statements sort of more as a mere uh, you know reflection, but rather kind of giving shedding some light on things that may not be able to be uh, visible. Reviewing financial statements that's an important thing to consider. Um, you know, cybersecurity is is one that that is certainly something that rating agencies are very focal on the succession planning and, and continued operations, disaster mitigation. Those are all things that uh, I would say have increased as time has gone on as far as being risk that seem to be of interest to the market. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd add that a lot of those risks that you identified, you know, yes, ESG has highlighted them, but those are all risks that even if we didn't have ESG would be items that, you know, issuers and rating agencies would be addressing. I mean, cybersecurity, and if you have a ransomware, you know, the cost of that, I mean, that's an impact on just financial management, you know, even away from ESG. Yep. And operations, if they shut you down for a period of time, for sure. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and then the other question that we had come in is, are you aware of any reporting changes to the ACFR, either voluntary or required? Um, and, and I am not at this time. Um, I, I know that there's some discussion of, of, of those kinds of things, but I, I don't know that there is anything at this point um, that has has materialized. Are, are you aware of anything, Scott? I'm not, other than to the extent, you know, just what we've just been talking about in terms of disclosure. You know, if there's something, well, let me say it this way, there may be something that might be appropriate to bring out in the MDNA um, if it's material, if it's important. But no, I'm not aware of any any required uh, uh, items right now. You, the one thing, again, kind of from a speaking to the market perspective, perspective, to the extent that you're an issuer and you're providing disclosures, you know, in an offering document that has raised to the level of being a risk disclosure, you know, that certainly is something that you'd want to consider and, and you know, speak to your um, financial team about whether, whether incorporating those into the ACFR would make sense. Mm -hmm. No, totally okay. agree. And on the disclosure front, I think, you know, it's important to highlight that issuers, you know, should work with their financing team, their municipal advisor and their bond disclosure council uh, to address you know, what's needed for disclosure. You know, materiality is a big part of it. Um, I think you're starting to see some disclosures that are out there talking about what a community is doing um, within their their boundaries, you know, programs, social programs, which are good things to disclose. But, you know, are those you know programs or initiatives you know, helping the bottom line of the community, or are they simply just kind of, you know, um, informational items that may or may not be relevant or material for disclosure document? Um, next slide, we just, you know, highlight some recent ESG related financings that have been in the press. Um, you know, the city of Atlanta did an ESG uh, um, social bond for geo public general obligation, public improvements. You know, 369 million, and it was highlighted that there was 40, 54 investors interested in this transaction. Um, not, not sure how many of those investors were for the ESG designation, but um, 54 investors on a $369 million transaction is a pretty impressive number. Um, the city of Chicago, for their sales tax securitization corporation, um, will be pricing next week um, some social bonds that um, relate to the city's um, recovery plan. And a lot of press out there for this transaction you know, on their website, they actually have an opportunity for investors in Chicago or residents in Chicago to buy these bonds on a retail basis. Um, the website further promotes, you know, it's an opportunity for residents, investors to 
you know, help the city address climate change, help uh, increase affordable housing, and also strengthen neighborhoods in the Chicago area. On the environmental side, um, there's an example here for a transaction in Fort Wayne about some green bonds for a sewage works project. Um, you know, other environmental examples is um, the, the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, since 20, 2016 also, have been issuing green bonds for sewer projects. Um, you know, self-designated, and we'll go into some more of the designation details later, but it's self-designated, but, you know, they have applied an ESG or green bond tag to their social or to their sewer bonds since 2016. And one other, one other example of a social bond, uh, the state of Massachusetts in 2021 uh, issued some bonds, um, sustainability bonds, they call them, for the state of Massachusetts SRF. And this is the State Revolving Fund Program, which are bonds that are issued to provide funds to make loans to communities within the state boundaries. Uh, they were sustainable bonds in the sense that they were bond proceeds that were used to make loans to economic disadvantaged communities in the state of Massachusetts. So many examples as to how you know the ESG you know title designation can be applied to different financings in the municipal market. And finally, for this section, you know, you know ESG, you know, it's not going to go away. And again, you know, a theme I think that's been mentioned a couple times is you know government operations, you know, mirror and match basically ESG activities. Um, there is more interest in ESG from the investor side. There's more interest in ESG from the rating side and you know as scott highlighted there may be more interest in esg from the regulatory side so obviously this is something that's not going to go away um you know there have been recently some some uh, stories about political issues um about esg but esg is not a red or blue um a matter um, esg is an opportunity for governments to put that aside and really focus on the opportunities and the components that may be out there for your community to address you know, what's important to you and your stakeholders, sustainability, diversity, equity, inclusion discussions. Um, ESG and sustainability planning is useful for many reasons, as outlined in the bottom of the slide. Um, I would highlight my, my hometown that I live just recently created a sustainability committee um, that reports to the city council. And part of that sustainability committee is to address, you know, many of the dot points here as to how it can make our city more sustainable, how it can be make our city more attractive and how it can make our city you know, a better place for employees to work, all mirroring some of the items that Susan mentioned earlier as to you know, what is ESG. So with that, now I'll turn the presentation over to either Susan or Scott to talk about ESG operational considerations. Okay, great. And a heads up, a polling question will be launched momentarily for those of you seeking CPE. Please go ahead and, and respond to that as we talk through the next slides. Um, so as as you think through ESG, you may be considering, um, you know, what can I do from, or should I be doing for my seat? And really, as we've been talking about developing that ESG strategy or perhaps a sustainability plan, you know, if that makes more sense for, for you as a governmental entity, um, can address ESG issues and be a good first step. At a minimum, thinking through the kinds of considerations that we've discussed on the call today and identifying, um, these considerations for your departments would be a helpful exercise. Um, on the next webinar series scheduled um, for January 26th, we're gonna talk through how to start this process and hopefully, um, however, hopefully this discussion and looking at this list of the parts of your organization has made you think about some opportunities. Um, strategizing can be helpful for your leadership team to prioritize efforts around ESG. And um, let's face it, no organization, company, or government can tackle really every issue under the ESG umbrella, but certainly some of the issues um, that can be identified, can be identified and should be identified to assist with sustainability. Okay, next slide. Um, ESG, you know, isn't just a concept, but there are some measurable reasons to implement strategies. Um, we've talked about this, knowing risk can reduce the likelihood of the, the risk will come to fruition or at least mitigate that risk. Um, planning around disasters and cyber attacks uh, can't erase it, but you know it can reduce the harm that could result from it. And additionally, there's some opportunities to save money and gain grants or tax credits for energy transition related or greenhouse gas reducing projects. 
um, the implementation of solar projects, energy efficiency projects, and electric vehicle deployment makes sense to prioritize and consider some of the costs um, of these many projects that, you know, as they have decreased over the years, like, you know, solar projects are much less expensive than they were even five years ago. Um, you know, you can kind of then look to see if they maybe they're more affordable for a long term operational savings. Um, you know, when you're looking really not only is ESG is the right thing to do, but really how does this affect the operations of, of my organization? Um, and looking at, you know, right now the availability uh, for tax credits and grants uh, that, that may not be as present as they are currently in the future. And then finally, kind of that ability to attract more investors to financings, um, you know, either through bond designation or even through better disclosure, uh, even if bonds aren't designated. Um, in, we are hearing that investor investors have interest in knowing these issues and how they affect organizations, and it does give them more uh, more confidence in the leadership teams of these organizations. So even with the projections and of the slight, um, you know. Uh, recession in, in 2023, again, uh, that that ability to keep those employees is certainly important and um, ESG can help build investor and community goodwill. Uh, finally, um, you know, really reducing the risk of regulation is uh, in oversight to the extent that you're addressing these things. As you know, these are things that uh, when you're addressing things, it's less likely that you're going to have to catch up. Um, you know, if a regulation is put in place, you're really already poised to to uh, address anything that that may be regulated down the road. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, really, um, ESG provides leadership teams with the needed transparency of known risk. It provides a roadmap for these management teams and can be important for various stakeholders companies that you support and, um, you know, funding to support ESG related projects um, and really get the confidence of your tax and rate payers. Next slide. So um, when looking at kind of how to best identify uh, material risk, um, you know, and this is something that we've discussed in in different places, but really knowing, you know, kind of the difference between risk factors and known trends. Um, risk factors may occur, but it's speculative. The disclosure depends on whether, you know, it is likely to occur. And known uh, trends, that that's something that has occurred or will occur and is likely, you know, to have a significant impact on the finances. So, um, you know, if you're unsure, again, as to whether it's it's a risk factor or a trend, um, you know, that's the kind of thing to have that discussion with your counsel and your legal counsel and financial advisors to help, um, you know, talk about whether it's something that should be a part of your disclosure. So, you know, we're gonna dive into this framework um, again on the next webinar and help kind of think about, um, you know, the best ways to get going on, you know, strategy. But, um, you know, the, the first part really is just making that assessment that we've been talking about, looking at risk, looking at opportunities, looking at the things that you've done that may fall under the umbrellas of ESG. Developing the strategy is the next step. Um, communicating that story to uh, stakeholders uh, within your organization and then you know executing the plan and reporting back out to stakeholders on an ongoing basis um, you know of the pieces of the plan that are being implemented and the achievements that you may be making that are measurable such as you know, if you choose to measure greenhouse gas reductions um, implement initiatives around DEI those are all things that can be you know provided out um, then to to your different stakeholders, you know, and also just to, um, again, communities a as a whole that, that may have interest in employees. I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Scott. Um, real quick, though, Susan, before we move on, um, there was a question that came in while you were speaking, and, and you kind of addressed this point, but I, did, I, I want to acknowledge the question and then add to it that, you know, the, the question was, we've, uh, 
one of the listeners is at different times, they've undertaken efforts that could be viewed as ESG initiatives, uh, but they haven't really done that under an adopted policy uh, for the community. And so the question is, should they look at creating such a policy or adopt a resolution to try to memorialize those efforts? And, and I think our response would be, yeah, that, that would be great. Um, you know, develop a plan. And, and you know, a, as importantly, as we've talked about throughout this whole thing, this is what governments do. So take credit for what you're already doing. Um, you know, take advantage of that. Tell your story. This is an opportunity. There's, you know, there's always going to be more that any of us can do. But please take advantage of this and and use it as an opportunity to tell your story, um, and, and use that as a, a springboard to develop your plan as you move forward. Yeah, absolutely. And just really quickly to add on that, what were your finding when talking to clients, whether they be schools or cities? Um, is that oftentimes, or utilities, oftentimes many of these things that we've been talking about are things that they've already either taken on, um, you know, have already some progress on or completed. Um, you know, so just knowing what ESG is, what investors are looking for, what stakeholders are looking for, and bringing that together as a story is, you know, equally important because you're then be able to address these things um, that, that you're doing already and and look at the gaps of where maybe you need to make some progress. Okay. All right. With Get that, I think we, we're flipping to, uh, to Dave uh, real quick. Yeah. Um, and, you know, quickly just kind of talking about, you know, a project that's in front of you. Um, you know, ESG is a, a good way to kind of blend in with the financing plan for a project and have a good ESG plan in place as you go through determining a project. You know, on this page, we talk about how bond designations and tax credit opportunities, which we'll talk about a little bit ago, kind of may relate to low interest, forgivable loans and grants that you may receive from the state and federal government. But as you're, you know, working on a project, let's say you're doing a public safety building, you know, knowing what your ESG initiatives are will be helpful as you develop the finance plan for that. You know, geothermal, solar, other components that might be part of your ESG plan, having that in place will only help make the process and looking at a project you know, go smoother. Um, with respect to tax credit opportunities, just want to highlight quickly the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this was, you know, signed into law back in August of 2022, but it, it's legislation that has extended to the public sector quite a few tax credits that previously were only available to the private sector for energy producing type projects and carbon reduction projects. Um, there's, you know, many examples at the bottom of the page here, but this is something that Baker Tilly has provided other webinars and has other information on, so we won't spend a lot of time on this, but just something to be aware of that goes hand in hand with ESG initiatives in the sense that if you're looking to, you know, do some solar projects, add some solar panels to the city or village buildings, um, you may be able to get a tax credit from the federal government for part of those solar panels. Um, and again, just mentioning kind of what I mentioned before is that, you know, ESG just aligns quite well with project development, project planning. Um, and that, you know, a completed ESG plan or sustainability plan, you know, will put you in a position to understand where you could look at for funding opportunities, whether it be from the federal government, um, you know, through investment infrastructure job acts or the Inflation Reduction Act that I mentioned, or, you know, a project that might be eligible for some state funding, you know, through uh, EPA programs, economic development, community development block grants, um, you know, having all that in place before you move forward is a good opportunity to, you know, be aligned so that you're not patchworking a project and a financing plan together uh, as you near the end of the process. So Scott, I'll turn it back over to you to talk about bond designations. Yeah, thanks Dave. Um, we, we've got uh, just a few minutes left and so we're just going to highlight at a very big picture level here, um, just kind of an introductory re introduction really to, to bond designation and, and what that might mean. And we'll, we'll dive into that in more detail in, in uh, future webinars. But as, as you look at the, the bond designation market right now, this is a, a still early but growing market within um, the U.S. And so we've got a variety of types of designations, green bonds, climate bonds, social bonds, sustainable bonds. There's a variety of, of nomenclature that goes around this, but there isn't one industry standard yet and may never be uh, for green bond certification. Um, instead, we've got really two different regimes that most of 
the municipal financings in the U.S. are following, and that's the, the Climate Bonds Initiative and then also the International Capital Markets Association. So those two entities and, and the um, rules, if you will, the guidelines that they prescribe for obtaining their designation are really the, the two main areas that are, are being looked at with um, uh, U.S. issuers at, at this point. So if we flip to the, the next slide, th this just kind of gives you a, a visualization of some of the projects that might fit a green um, uh, designation. And we've talked about several of these already. And, and you know, again, are revolving around a lot of the things that governments do, especially those governments that have uh, municipal utilities, but pollution prevention control, clean transportation, um, energy efficiency, green buildings, uh, just renewable energy, a variety of things there that really fold into services that uh, governments provide. And, and these are the types of things where if you're looking uh, to do a project like that in, in the future, it might be worth your while to investigate whether or not uh, attaching a, a, a green bond designation to those uh, future financings might be advantageous. It's, it may not work in, it may not make sense in, in every situation, but in some situations it might. On, on a social bond perspective, uh, again, looking at, at the types of projects that are involved, um, access to essential services, affordable housing, again, those things that we've talked about, those are, are key things that are really um, being addressed with the social bond designation and, and really looking at our more disadvantaged communities um, and trying to help lift them up and provide opportunities. Those are, are where uh, the social bond designations are, are really falling uh, in a lot of cases these days. So just to, to wrap this session up briefly, I mean, we've, we've got a variety of, of topics here that lead into ESG and things that you all can be thinking about as you go about your uh, management of your local community and, and where ESG touches and, and ways that you can uh, pick this issue up and move it forward and, and really uh, get to a situation where you've got a strategy in place to remain sustainable, both from an environmental perspective and a social perspective, governance, uh, and, and uh, really develop and, and sell your communities as uh, the great places that they are. So, Susan, go ahead. I think you had a few final comments. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm going to skip my final comment and go into a last question that I think wraps it up well. Um, one of the questions that came in is, in the midst of launching a strategic plan, do you have suggestions um, about or, or hesitations around uh, things that you should consider with an ESG strategy? Um, I, I guess what I would suggest is going you know, back to all those things that ESG touches upon, thinking about the things that you can identify with your leadership team makes sense in make the planning process so that it is tailored to what uh, will give the most uh, operational benefit for your organization. But uh, with that, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dave, uh, Scott, anything to, to say in parting? No, appreciate the time. Interesting and exciting topic and, and hope everybody got something out of it. And um, uh, Susan, I don't know if you're gonna mention it, but we do have a, another webinar continuing this this topic coming up. So hopefully we'll see you again. Absolutely. We'd love to have you and a deeper dive into to these subjects then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.